good afternoon. Hi, Professor. How are you doing? Oh, good morning. I see. Uh, it's time, and uh, uh, we are now uh, live. We are live. We are live, and we could proceed with the session. Over to you, Dr. Maroja. Uh, good day, Professor Milton. Great. How is it wherever you are? Uh, proceed, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Hi, Professor. How are you doing? Oh, good morning. I see. Hello, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today we are going to start the the next the session related to chemical, biological warfare, and international criminal courts. Uh, today we are going to have the the, the presence of Professor uh, Dawalkanath Shipati. He is a professor of of international criminal law of the Singular Singularity University in India. We also we are going to have uh, the companion of Professor Frimpong. Uh, he is the founding law dean of Gimpa. Um, university and the funding body of UPSA universities. Um, also is going to join us uh, Professor Rama Dugudumela. She's a professor of international criminal law in India. At the same time, uh, Maria Mercedes Pisani and Alessandra Lanciotti from Italy, from the University of Padua. And also um, uh, Dr. Itaba Ranzane, he's the director of Government, government and legal services from the government of, of South Africa. At the same time, uh, Madasela Leso, he's uh, the director of of the government government, government international real relations of the Department of Justice. Also, um, a, a researcher, um, Brian from Ram, Ram, Ramafane. Uh, he's a researcher at our at the center of international criminal justice. And finally, we have the presence of Marie Kaur. She's a, 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 an attorney at the ICC. And uh, Brenda Okot, she's a special expert international attorney from Sweden. OK, Professor, I'll oh, pass it to Professor thank you, Yes. Thank you, Doc. Thank you for that uh, uh, erudite introduction. Um, Dr. Giovanni Marotti is uh, the Director of International Programs at the Center for International Criminal Justice, Africa. He is concerned with uh, mobilizing all the programs and uh, content and uh, internal issues connected to of uh, an international character for the Center. He does a very good job, and uh, we are pleased and we are proud to have you here. Uh, we'll be soon joined by a number of professors. This is a professorial board, which uh, panel, which discusses issues, as uh, Dr. Marotta has just indicated. And uh, the topic is a, a very, very hot topic, uh, chemical and biological weapons. Uh, there's also the nuclear weapons, which we are going to look into as to whether uh, those can be enforced uh, by the International Criminal Court. Uh, of course, this is a debate that has been raging on for a long time, and uh, we still want to perpetuate this debate, but give it uh, more flesh. We reinforce uh, the aspects that have been contentious with respect to uh, this particular debate. Okay, um, as we wait for our colleagues to join us, we just want to announce one or, few, one or two things which are in connection with our programs at the center and in terms of uh, our broadcasts. One, we're going to strictly stick to uh, one hour, 30 minutes maximum for these programs. Uh, I think Dr. Marotta will be handling that. I uh, just want to announce that so that uh, we are able to accomplish what we do within that time. So, so that we don't extend more than that. We are people who have other engagements and we also want to uh, reorganize our program so that the other contents can come in in good time. Uh, the other issue is that we'll be reducing the number of uh, schedules. We'll not be having this on a weekly basis. We'll be having our programs uh, twice in a month. This is the reason, uh, the reason for this particularly is to allow us to be able to uh, adjust and put in other contents. We are developing other contents which will be broadcasting within the, the center 
and those ones include uh, we'll be having featuring interviews with uh, personalities within the international criminal justice cycles. We'll be dealing therefore with the people at the ICC who will be featured more often. We we'll also deal with uh, politicians, heads of governments and states. We could feature individual of them, we are some of them online and uh, address issues which are pertinent. We are also going to allow uh, news analysis for matters which are very uh, pertinent, which are co contemporary. Uh, apart from that, uh, we'll also include, uh, uh, you know, countries. We could feature a particular country and give the context of what is happening. For instance, Afghanistan, uh, we could try and feature. And so those are the kind of content and others which we'll be able to uh, bring forth in due course. Uh, so uh, this will allow us at the center to uh, mobilize ourselves and we'll also welcome the panels, panelists who would want to join us on those particular programs. And those who have features would want to have them featured would also be part of uh, that arrangement. But most of those programs will be run by myself and the director of international programs, uh, Dr. Giovanni Marotta. Those are the key things uh, that we might have to deal with. Uh, that's why we are restructuring the whole arrangement. We also need to give adequate ample time for our panelists to prepare for you know, effective debate. That is why we allow, we'll be allowing that once in a, twice in a month. And probably it might go on to once in a month when the other programs become more, more crowding and more engaging. Okay. Um, Apart from that, today, before we embark on the real debate, uh, we want to feature, there's a current issue which we can probably discuss with uh, Mr. Marotta, Dr. Marotta, rather. Um, Dr. Marotta, thank you for my, the time that you've given me. Now, we recall in retrospect, uh, we saw, we saw that uh, the United States has slammed uh, the ICC prosecutor and the head of uh, jurisdiction complementarity uh, uh, at the International Criminal Court with the uh, uh, visa, uh, not just visa, in fact, there are sanctions, a wide range of sanctions that have been slammed upon these two individuals. And uh, the indication that those who support them would be supporting them would be able to uh, face the same wrath. This was by the Secretary of State, uh, Mr. Pompeo. Uh, what is your view on this, really? What is happening with the United States and uh, the ICC? Well, what but, I see here, yes, thank you, Professor. What I see here is that I, they are um, in, in some in some point uh, trying to pressure uh, the ICC, not um, in a political uh, way, uh, not to uh, prosecute American citizens. Uh, I think this like uh, they are trying to shield um, probably a more than more. I think the issue goes so far that than any military rank in duties right now. I think it's more uh, for protecting the contractors that that have done in the past services for the, the government of the United States. Um, uh, if you see if you see the context uh, when the United States back then in like 18 years ago it was yes 18 years ago after uh, well, more 19 years ago it's going to be after 9/11 uh, the, the the invasion to the first uh, uh, military engagement uh, in Afghanistan and then going to uh, Iraq in 2003. Iraq is, yeah, is going to be 17 years and uh, the military intervention of, in Afghanistan is going to be, is going to be uh, 19 or 18 years. Um, the, the first, um, there was a lot of uh, money expenses related to the military issue then, uh, uh, then after the, the, the Congress administration back then they decided to cut money to the to the to the to the military and that's why they decided to to use the contractors and at the same time 
they thought that using contractors will shield them uh, not to be prosecuted against um, war crimes or any that kind of uh, uh, felonies, for example, in in a court in that claims universal jurisdiction or in an, or in an international court. However, uh, over this past 20 years in, in global as a whole um, related to uh, the contractor business, uh, the private sector, the private military sector, uh, if you see, and, and probably we can, we as, uh, as the ICR Justice Africa, we can do a research related on that because I don't know if right now it exists a kind of research is how much money the private military sector, the contractors, um, especially in the United States, have um, give money for both campaigns, Republican or Democrats. So, uh, I mean, that, that's the lobby they have been doing there. Um, so I think I, that this move of Trump uh, trying to, to um, ban and trying to block uh, the, 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 not the judges, more the, the prosecutors, it's more like trying to wave uh, a white flag to the contractors uh, and telling them, okay, if you support me in, in now in November, you probably will have four more years of impunity if you do something that was in our, in, in our interest overseas and you committed some by negligence some kind of international crime. I mean, there, there, there is no go, there is no one who's going to trial you in any part of the world. So I think the 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 goes that way. And on the other hand, we are right now entering in another cold war between the U.S. and Russia. Um, it started with the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, we we can we just saw that when uh, Vladimir Putin told the world that they have discovered the vaccine, it was not the race who who put the first man on the moon. It was who who who, who controls um, medical this new medical case of the pandemic. Trying so, uh, if, for example. Um, they will start. Uh, I mean, there there are countries in South, South America that in Latin America that will start using the Russian vaccines, um, and because of that, Oxford, that well, you know, Great Britain also is the is the the big brother of the U.S. They will also they are trying to enter to to other <laughs> Latin American countries. So we we'll yeah. see uh, once again a cool uh, another in another scenario for a cold war. So prob probably um, we will enter into into an as I as, as I just have uh, made this example before uh, the war the way we will see war between countries between uh, continents is going to be very very different. Probably we will engage. In another third world war, but it's not going to be the same scenario that was in World War II or World War One. I. I mean, it's going to be different. It's going to be more related to economics. It's going to be more related to medicine. It's going to be more related to espionage and and cyber attacks and um, I don't know biological. Uh, uh, this is going to be like the use. It's going to be more like the way. Um, the war of Vietnam is going to be more like um, um, uh, a guerrilla war, nonetheless, uh, nonetheless globally. So I think um, that's the reason why the U.S. is trying to tell uh, the international community that even though there is an ICC that is going to try uh, um, war crimes, they are going to be over that so they can protect themselves against this kind of possible scenarios. But, um, but I mean, that's, that's a little bit um, 
it's more defending the interests of a private sector that they, that they are seeing from, from right now, I don't know, 30, 40, uh, 50 years, uh, the profit of the market that they will engage in in the, in the coming years. I mean, if we enter in, in another scenario of Cold War mix up with uh, uh, gorilla, gorilla warfare in every different part of, of the world, I mean, that is the perfect storm market for the private um, contractors, military services. So they are trying to protect that, that um, they are trying to protect that future market. Uh, the audience need to understand that the US, the American, they in all, in all, um, in all the places, uh, uh, is going in any part, they will see um, a profit business. So that's the way they think. I mean, you know, it happens in, 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 in every level of the, of, of how the U.S. Uh, engage between them. They, they all will see, we can, what, what, you know, under these circumstances, how, how we can make money. So that's what I, that's what I think is going on behind uh, this pom this uh, Pompeo is uh, <laughs> Pompeo <laughs> yeah this Pompeo thing about uh, trying to trying to, <laughs> yes, trying, trying to uh, ban the prosecutors of the ICC is more I mean there are interests behind him related yes. to contractors so I mean they're trying to protect the um, the way um, they are the they are. They, we need to understand that the military private sector, they have this view as militaries. I mean, they always are two or three steps behind what's going really on in politics all around the world, even in the US and every other country. So they, they make all these um, projections and the statistics of how the market will weigh by, um, and they try to make to make some profit of, of, about that. So they, they yes, they. I mean, I mean, right now the business is going to be medicines related to the to all of this pandemic, and if I know uh, for uh, local, yeah, uh, military conflicts, and there's money. So they will try many countries, many. They will not. They will not send. Uh, normal uh, troops because of the of, of the COVID-19 today uh, situation so they will hire these uh, contractors to move to some places so so they see they are very insightful indeed uh, Dr. Marotta very insightful and, and, I, I and all the American con yeah. I mean and the the 80 percent of or I'm going to uh, the 90 percent of the of the market of the private uh, contractor services are American companies Yes, and, that, and that's it's a way the U.S. is protecting that kind of market, so they, because they want to have money from from, from it. So, so yes. I think that that's that's the real reason more than than trying to say that the that the U.S. is an autonomous country and they they have this uh, um, very remarkable, unvi unbelievable justice system. It's more it's more than that. It's, it's, I think they are trying to they. They are cooking the books. I mean, in all countries, there, there, there is, there is going to be. Okay, Dr. Marotta, I think time, time does not allow us to continue there, but I think we'll take it up from where you've stopped. It's okay. quite an interesting discourse. Let's welcome now uh, Professor uh, Rakanath Sripathi. Uh, can you hear us, Doctor Professor? Yes, sure, sure. I can hear you. Yes, always, Prof. And uh, a very good evening to both of you all. Okay, good evening, you, Professor and the co-host. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Uh, we were just discussing the latest contemporary issue uh, where the Americans uh, have issued more warnings and imposed sanctions on the ICC prosecutor. You aware of that? Yes, yes. Yes. So uh, just two days ago, there are news that uh, uh, Secretary of State was announcing that uh, they have actually frozen the assets of two personalities at the International Criminal Court, uh, namely the ICC prosecutor, um, Ms. Fatou Bensouda, and uh, Mr. Chok Chok, uh, sorry, I'll get the proper pronunciation, but the head of complementarity 
uh, he also heads juris jurisdictional department uh, jurisdictional complementarity uh, all these have been targeted because they are still in the argument of uh, the secretary of state of the united states they are still pursuing uh, the american interests the americans they, they are, so they say even those who are aiding them who are facilitating those uh, that pursuit against the american citizens would also face the same fate that is what briefly we are looking at just as a contemporary but uh, we will come you uh, once more before we we'll, uh, we proceed i would like to make an announcement that i, I just took keep you up to date with the announcement that we made. I made at the beginning. Uh, the two important announcements are that uh, we are restructuring our programs at the center. So we may end up having only uh, two sessions in a month for the panel discourse for the professors, but there are other contents that we are coming up with, which will run to give us enough time. We'll be featuring uh, personalities and institutions uh, like the ICC will be holding certain discourse with these particular persons in particular, uh, individuals or personalities at the ICC, uh, heads of state and governments all over the world, not just Africa. And uh, we'll also be featuring ministers of justice. We'll be featuring politicians, activists. So we are going to engage uh, a number of personalities internationally and in this particular program, it will be a one-on-one -on -one schedule. And you, if you definitely will be there if you're interested, you pick which topics you're interested in if you see any announcements. Uh, some of them, you could actually be handling those particular persons yourself if you have it's of interest to you. So these are the contents we want to generate with the center so that we don't just focus solely on the discourse. We also focus to hear from other people what they say and we engage them in issues of international criminal justice. The other point that we raised was that uh, we will stick to our initial program, which lasts one hour 90, the way we started, to allow for the professors to have sufficient time to attend to other things, because some people may not be able to make it, not because they don't want to, but the time factor does not allow them to engage into other things as well as this one. So we'll stick to one hour, 30 minutes for those two sessions we'll have in a month. So the next session we'll be having on the 28th of uh, September. We are only left with one more session this month for the discourse panel for the professors. Uh, but in between, there are a lot of programs which we'll announce and we'll be informing members if somebody is interested, they join to participate upon interest. Uh, we'll be featuring countries also, uh, so we can feature Afghanistan and get there and you know, see what we feature countries that have relevance to international criminal justice. Uh, the idea is to enlighten our viewers uh, on what is going on. Uh, the other thing also will be co discussing the contemporary issue, just like what we've been discussing with uh, Dr. Marota just now. It's a very interesting one. Like any new uh, development that takes place within the ICC, we take it up. It will take our time and we feature it, we discuss it, and we engage other persons. Those are the announcements we made, uh, Professor, in your absence. And so uh, today we are proceeding with uh, uh, the chemical and biological weapons, uh, nuclear weapons, uh, in connection with uh, the Rome Statutes, basically, when you talk about the ICC. I think the discourse will feature largely on what the Rome Statute provides. I, I believe most of this discourse will uh, center around uh, the provisions of Article 8, uh, sub article uh, paragraph B, mm -hmm. seven, eight, as the other uh, of my panels, my co uh, uh, professors will be able to bring out. So uh, I hand you back to that is what we had, Professor Sipathi, in your absence. And I hand you back over to uh, the Director of International Programs, my co host, Dr. Marota. Over to you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you also, Professor Kipati, to be with us. Um, the, as before, um, starting the, the conversation uh, related to the prosecutor of the ICC, well, I need to remember that, that the, the today panel is related to chemical, biological warfare, um, and the ICC. So, uh, as usual, I bring the question here is, um, that among scholars, um, there is a discussion 
related to if the um, use of chemical or biological weapons in armed conflict um, is a serious crime of international concern. However, uh, it should be explicitly prohibited by the Rome Statute because according uh, to, the, to, the, to the statute, it refers um, not such as a chemical um, uh, weapon, it only refers as, one moment please, over here. Um, it only refers as, as, if, um, as, uh, as weapon of asphyxiation. So um, to the panel right now here, um, what do you think about this? Should, uh, should be an amendment to the Rome statue uh, directly as, um, that it should, that should be uh, criminalized chemical and biological and bio biological weapons such as chemical and bi biological weapons or it should keep as uh, the text is um, um, uh, in Article 8 of the Rome Statute. May I? Yes, Professor. Thank you. Uh, the Rome Statute does not specifically mention chemical weapons by name. Although a lot of efforts were made by the state parties at the time of the signing of the Rome Statute in 1998, to include even the use of chemical weapons as a part of war crimes. But uh, some of uh, states, uh, some of the states were not ready to accept it. And uh, therefore, uh, the chemical weapons were not included in the Rome Statute initially in 1998. But during the Kampala amendments, states have managed to include uh, certain kinds of chemical weapons. And uh, the most uh, relevant article of the Rome Statute in this regard is Article 8, Clause 2, Clause B of the Rome Statute, which deals with war crimes. And uh, this section of the Rome Statute, which deals with war crimes, includes certain provisions which may be interpreted and understood as applying to chemical weapons. The word chemical weapon is not used, but the provisions are there which can be interpreted and understood as referring to chemical weapons. Now, Article 8. Clause 2, Clause P, 17th para, makes it a war crime to employ poison, poisoned weapons, and para 18 refers to employing asphyxiating, poisonous, or other gases, and all analogous liquids, materials, and methods of war. So here the word chemical weapon is missing. But the words used are poison and poisoned weapons. So poison also amounts to a chemical, a chemical which acts on the nervous system of an individual. So in a broad sense, if we consider this word poison or poisoned weapons, it does uh, relate to chemical weapons. Now again, uh, para 18 also refers to employing asphyxiating poisonous or other gases. Now, gases are again chemicals. They are no different. So, although the word chemical is not used, these can be understood as being chemicals that are used in warfare. 
and all analogous liquids. Analogous is liquids which are similar to gases and which are poisonous in nature. Then materials and methods of warfare. So these two provisions of the Rome Statute, although do not use the word chemical weapons, do consist of these two provisions which speaks of chemical weapons. And we should at least interpret and understand it that way, that the Rome Statute includes chemical weapons. Now, para 20 of 8, 2, clause uh, 8, article 8, clause 2, clause B, para 20 clearly makes it a war crime to employ weapons, projectiles, and material, and methods of warfare. So, projectiles with chemical warheads, because we have weapons, missiles with conventional warheads, missiles with nuclear warheads, and missiles with chemical warheads. So, when we employ weapons and projectiles with chemical warheads, and also materials and methods of warfare, it does amount to a kind of a uh, chemical warfare, and... Uh, the Rome Statute is, uh, I feel, quite clear that it includes the chemical weapons, so the word chemical weapons is not used. Now, these chemicals, which are of a nature to cause superfluous injury or unnecessary suffering, because if we go through the laws of war under international humanitarian law, one of the objectives of international humanitarian law is to avoid unnecessary suffering on the part of the combatants. Now, if we have to kill a combatant, fire a bullet in him. He dies. But is there a need to use a chemical weapon that would make him suffer for hours together? He would not die immediately, but he would suffer a lot and then finally die. So this is unnecessary suffering, which the uh, provisions of international humanitarian law clear, clearly prohibit. And it is one of the objectives of international humanitarian law to limit unnecessary suffering. And uh, states today at the time of war also use tracer bullets. Now, these tracer bullets are such bullets that when they enter the human body, they explode inside the human body. And all the small lead pieces get embedded in all the important organs like the heart, the liver, the lungs, they puncture the lungs. So the chance of survival is zero. In the case of a single bullet being fired, the soldier stands a chance to survive. But when a trace of bullet is fired, there is chances are zero. So is there a necessity to use such weapons in warfare? And on similar lines, chemical weapons are also uh, such that uh, when the chemical weapons are used on civilian population in a war, then uh, Chemical weapons are of such a nature that it has an effect on future generations. Children would be born with disabilities, deformities. So it is not a weapon that simply affects the present generation, but future generations. And therefore, in my opinion, it is a very, very serious crime and an international crime, rather war crime. And therefore, I sincerely feel that the ICC should consider this and then start investigations uh, against any head of the state or country where such uh, chemical weapons have been used. Now, the provision that is uh, part of the Rome Statute, that is Article 8, Clause 2, Clause B, that is the Para 17 and 18. These provisions 
are subject to a comprehensive prohibition and are included uh, in an annexure to the Rome Statute. Since no annexure to the provision was agreed to by the states, no one can be prosecuted under this provision. So there lies the difficulty of the International Criminal Court. The court should overcome this. And although the Rome Statute should be understood as also prohibiting chemical weapons, as I mentioned earlier, Article 8, Clause 2, Clause B is applicable only to international armed conflicts. Now, it is very, very clear that Article 8, Clause 2, Clause B, Paris uh, 17 and 18 apply only to international armed conflicts. And uh, if there is a non-international armed conflict where chemical weapons have been used, then the court cannot proceed against the person or the perpetrator of the crime of using chemical weapons because this article does not apply. And we do have another provision that is Article 8, Clause 2, Clause E, which deals with provisions relating to non-international armed conflict. But these crimes which are listed under Article 8, Clause 2, Clause E do not mention chemical weapons or any weapon that is uh, uh, mentioned in Article 8, Clause 2, Clause B is not mentioned in Article 8, Clause 2, Clause E. So here again, there is a kind of a restriction on the part of the court to proceed against perpetrators of the crime. So these are the difficulties that uh, the court faces. Now the best example is that of uh, Syria. Now when there was an internal conflict between Syrian forces and the ISIS in uh, 2013, uh, there were reports that chemical weapons were used. But this conflict is not an international armed conflict. It is a non-international armed conflict, and therefore the ICC cannot proceed. Of course, uh, during the eight-year war, a war was fought for eight years between Iran and Iraq, where the then president of Iraq, uh, Saddam Hussein, had used chemical weapons against the Kurds living in the north of Iraq. So this, of course, happened, and uh, the court can only uh, prosecute or uh, go against, I mean, order prosecutions against activities or crimes that have taken place after the coming into force of the Rome Statute. And this happened during 1980 to 1988. But it it has been the biggest and the largest use of chemical weapons in the history of war in the world. What Saddam Hussein did from 80 to 88 in this eight year war, the volume of chemical weapons that have been used is the largest compared to all other wars where chemical weapons have been used. So when we have such a huge example of the devastation that chemical weapons can uh, bring about to the humankind or the human race, then I do not understand why states are not taking it as a serious crime. And even at the ICC negotiations, Rome Statute negotiations, states should have been more definite, they should have been more concrete in their ideas, and they should have included specifically the word chemical weapon, the use of chemical weapons in any war, then the court will have jurisdiction. They should have specifically mentioned, but they did not do that. But what little that they have included during the Kampala amendments, there also we have limitations. Because where one provision speaks of uh, weapons which are similar to chemical weapons, 
applies only to international armed conflicts. The other provision, which applies to non-international armed conflict, does not mention these weapons. So these difficulties are there. But however, another problem is Syria is not a party to the Rome Statute. So the question arises whether the court can order a prosecution against Syria or whoever is uh, the perpetrator of the crime in Syria. Uh, since Syria is not a party to the Rome Statute, there is no possibility of the court proceeding against Syria. However, if the Security Council can make a referral to the court, then the court can exercise jurisdiction. Now, even this, in fact, uh, a draft resolution was presented before the Security Council in 2014 for a Security Council referral, referral against Syria, but uh, uh, Russia and uh, the in, uh, US, US, China, both uh, exercised veto and defeated the uh, draft resolution. So even the Security Council referral, which would have helped the ICC to uh, prosecute the perpetrators of the crime in Syria, fell flat. They could not do it. So we do have problems. And uh, now, as I said, use of chemical weapons is a very serious offense. In fact, we do have a convention uh, that is Convention on Chemical Weapons signed in the year 1993 and which came into force in 1997. Now, this convention has uh, a long list of weapons uh, which cannot be used in warfare. In fact, the convention bans the use of certain chemical weapons in warfare. So, since the convention was signed in 1993, and came into force in 1997. The Rome Statute was signed in the year 1998. So the state parties could have taken a thing from the convention and included some provisions of the convention in the Rome Statute for banning use of chemical weapons. And in case chemical weapons are used, the court shall have jurisdiction. This should have been done, but some of the states have failed to do it. So, despite all these drawbacks and difficulties, I sincerely feel that the ICC should have jurisdiction against states who make use of chemical weapons in warfare. That is my sincere opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for, for your your like participation in this debate. Um, well, uh, Professor Milton, do you want to add uh, something uh, about what uh, Professor uh, Shripati has shared with us? Oh, yes, Dr. Marota, thank you very much, uh, directors and uh, international programs. But uh, I'd like to extend my thanks for a very intellectual presentation by Dr. Professor Dr. Silfati as usual. Uh, that was very comprehensive and very, very incisive. Uh, I can see that really a powerful panel. Now, um, this discourse that relates to uh, chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons in the context of uh, international criminal justice can be traced way back. Uh, I've heard what the professor's uh, analysis the professor has provided very, very comprehensive indeed. Now, mine 
is simply to reinforce what he, he has, uh, the professor has presented to um, uh, the viewers and to this panel. I totally agree that uh, the professor has analyzed the critical uh, provisions and uh, instruments that are pertinent to this particular discourse. Now, uh, I just want to bring out some issues which should be able to provoke further thoughts between us and uh, further intellectual analysis. Uh, let's start off with, um, but before I get into the Rome Statute, which is a recent development in uh, the realm of international uh, criminal justice, I want us to look back and examine some of the uh, statutes, rather some of the instruments that uh, Dr. Professor Sipathi had pointed out. Um, but before then, I would also want to indicate one thing. Uh, the question of language and the canons of interpretation are going to be very critical in this discourse. The canons of interpretation of statutes, of uh, you know, texts. We have various canons of interpretation, of construction of legal texts and uh, documents that relate to issues of international law. And those interpretation exercises ordinarily, invariably takes us back to the Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties. Most of the time, uh, many scholars in this kind of debate would quickly refer to, uh, you know, the Vienna Convention and use it to be able to shield or to fortify their line of argument. Uh, Section 34, 30, I'm not very precise about that, but depending on what line one is pursuing, they would try to have recourse to that. But I would want to pick out one thing from there. Uh, we have the literal interpretation of a text. Literal meaning we take it the way it is presented. Um, it may not take into account a lot of contextual uh, basis. We have also an interpretation, uh, mode of interpretation that would allow us to try to have a retrospective glance at uh, how the text came into existence. Uh, now, I will get back to that. I just hinted that briefly. But I want us to look at um, the other statutes or other instruments that were in place before the Rome Statute came into uh, operation. We have uh, the Biological Weapons Convention of 1972. We have the General Protocol to the Hague Convention, uh, actually, specifically the protocol. There was the Hague Convention, of course, of the 19. 77. And uh, on, in 1925, we had the uh, general protocol to that particular convention, which handled the issue of uh, uh, biological weapons, uh, the issue of this class of weapons. Now, what is critical as we proceed with this discourse is that there we have to look at whether the instrument bans the Development, that is the manufacture, the application, and possession, or use or employment, depending on the, the verb that has been applied. Uh, because uh, when we look at, when we come to look at what the Rome Statute states, we would question ourselves as to whether that particular provision, Article 8, uh, uh, 2, para, para, um, is it 17, sorry, uh, I'm not fair. Let me just get the correct one, which I want to refer specifically to. Uh, but let's just say, what does the Rome Statute do? Does it prohibit uh, use? Does it prohibit possession? Does it prohibit uh, development? Or does it prohibit, uh, you know, all other aspects that relating relates to that? That would give us a clue. But before then, again, uh, I want just to mention another statute. There's Convention on Prohibition of the Development Production and stockpiling of uh, bacteriology. That was 1972. Uh, remember that convention specifically prohibited the development of uh, bacteriological weapons, which obviously uh, using the same parameter, my colleague, uh, my professor, Dr. Sipati said, uh, it's a matter of, uh, I would say, semantical um, gimmicks, uh, linguistic agility, because uh, it may not use a particular word, but that would be synonymous with the use of another word or as a synonym. 
All right. Uh, this particular convention, as we can see, specifically prohibited to develop. But when we look at the Rome Statute, as we shall come to see, nothing talks about the development. It only seems to rush to prohibit uh, the use, the employment, which is the use of a particular uh, weapon. Okay. Uh, we are not going to delve into most of this. I don't want to delve into this. I'm just drawing my, your attention to the attention of the panel and possibly the viewers who are interested in following uh, this line of argument that there are other conventions that were in place. There are others that have prohibited the proliferation. Most of these have been multilateral, of course, in nature, given the gravity of the, of the weapons and the consequences. Now, let's get right on to the Rome Statute. Uh, my colleague, Professor uh, Dr. Sripathi has uh, said enough. Uh, I need not add more onto what he has said. Only I want to point out one thing. When we examine closely, uh, when we read positively, read and construe Article 8, uh, to B uh, 17, we can see that it bars the use of poisonous or poisoned weapons. Um, let's try to look at that. A similar provision which is related to that is the next one, which is uh, para 18, which uh, it says the war crime to use asphyxiation, asphyxiating poisonous or other gases. Uh, the way uh, I agree totally with the way uh, Professor the path indicated, the path rather, that uh, the use of this, what are these, the first thing you pose yourself, what really uh, are these gases? What are these poisonous items? How do you classify them? Are they not weapons? We, are they not chemicals? Would you argue that they're not chemicals in any case? Would you argue that they're not, uh, uh, yeah, chemicals particularly? When you talk about gases, well, how do you classify them? A broader classification would be that they're chemicals. But I want to take that argument a little bit further. Uh, let's try to look at the historical context, because literally this is what it is. Literally, again, one would argue that if it was the intention of the drafters to incorporate uh, the word chemicals or biological or nuclear openly, nothing would have stopped them from proceeding. So that has been a common statement. Uh, some of us as drafters I'm a legislative draft as well. So when we draft, we would always say, if it was the intention of the drafters uh, that time who drafted the instrument to do that, nothing would have stopped them than just to specifically state that. Uh, that, that is more of uh, trying to advance an argument in favor of literal interpretation. But that is not the only interpretation uh, of any available. So usually we'd want to go back. Let's get back to the drafting time. We look at the travel preparatory the, what that existed. What was the intention? One would argue, some scholars say, but it's not easy to know the intention of 120 uh, states. How would you discern that? But it is clear at the time of the drafting, there was a debate. Uh, you'll all agree that there was an argument as to whether to uh, include chemical weapons, biological weapons, vis-a-vis another argument as to whether to insist on nuclear weapons being introduced. When you look at this classification, it would appear that chemical and biological weapons were much more available to the less impecunious, the, the more impecunious states, the poorer states, the general, uh, you know, states, as compared to nuclear weapons, which was uh, the preserve of the rich and wealthy states. There was a debate during that time indeed uh, where people argued that it would be unfair, inequitably speaking, to incorporate, to prohibit only uh, biological and chemical weapons while not prohibiting strictly the nuclear weapons. Because somehow the wealthy states had stuck to their nuclear weapons for one reason or the other. They wanted to retain them. But when you analyze also the provision, it does not talk about the you, the retention, the possession. It wasn't prohibiting the possession. So the wealthy states, for instance, the United States, India, and China, all these had, uh, Dr. Sripathi will agree with me that uh, 
Uh, it is one of the most powerful <laughs> states in the world and very quiet. Yeah. <laughs> France, France also. Yeah, France indeed, absolutely. Uh, they did not, you know, nothing, it's like they wanted to stick to their weapons. None of them would be willing to proceed to have, uh, to advance a prohibition of the use of their weapons. So some class of people argued that, why would we insist on burning biological and chemical weapons, which are easily accessible to the poor, and yet we are not addressing the nuclear weapons. Uh, so you see the term there is, they're not even talking about possession. Nobody's talking, so how do we prohibit something which can be freely developed? It's like saying you can come into the room with a cobra, but uh, we allow you, that is not, you know, it's not an offense, but to allow your cobra to, to bite someone is an offense. Why do you allow such a person in the first instance to come in with a cobra? So this was the complication about these weapons. And so there was an argument at that particular time that really it would not be fair to prohibit two chemical and uh, biological weapons while not doing anything about nuclear weapons. It would be favoring the wealthy while the poor would also have their at least something more mass destruction uh, item. Be able to, uh, Okay, sorry. Yeah, so in effect, what, what we are saying here is uh, at that particular time, there was lack of agreement as to whether to incorporate this. And so the idea was abandoned. It was not included. So we can say expressly, explicitly, there was, it was abandoned, but the reason for its being abandoned, including this, would mean that if that argument was prolonged further, it would delay the passing of the Rome Statute. It would actually impede all the efforts or frustrate all the attempts to finalize the statute. So it was left, it was not included. And again, to uh, proceed to reinforce what my colleague, Professor Dilipathy, very ably put, he brought in the issue of the review conference. Uh, seven years later, uh, on, in 20, the year 2010, rather, to be more precise, in Kampala, when the review conference sat, the war crimes was one of the other areas that uh, uh, they focused. And this issue, as uh, Professor Sipati has ably put it, was also again on the table. But to be more specific, Belgium introduced, sought to introduce an amendment. The state of Belgium was interested in having to uh, amend, to have the provisions amended to include uh, all these other items that we have been skipped relating to weapons of uh, you know, chemical, biological, and nuclear. The same argument was advanced during this conference. It was seen during that short time, it was not possible. In fact, the idea was altogether abandoned uh, in the end because to take one side and abandon the issue of nuclear, uh, ab focus on biological and chemical weapons, while not addressing nuclear, was going to be a real prolonged debate. It was to resuscitate, resuscitate the debate that was going on uh, at the time of uh, the drafting of the Rome Conference. So we see that the attempt by Belgium to have the, the same definition introduced was abandoned. So that uh, these are the, the, there could be consensus. There was actually no consensus on this item, but the consensus was there on the other items of uh, amendment. So we see two things here. Uh, at the drafting of the Rome Statute, specifically the issue of chemical weapons, though introduced and biological, was abandoned. And again, another second attempt where Belgium spearheaded the amendment, the same was abandoned. So the question that we ask ourselves, uh, should we ignore the literal, the intention of the, the drafters when coming to interpret this text? Should we simply overlook? Because we can see that the intention of the drafters was clear, not include chemical. We cannot argue, for instance, or extend the argument that possibly the drafters intended, but they didn't have time. No, whatever they intended was re replicated, was actually represented on the text. So the question that uh, we would be asking ourselves is, was it really the intention of the drafters or those who sought to amend the draft that they had, to be able, was it their intention to include 
chemical, nuclear, and biological weapons? That's a very taxing question. As, as I was saying, uh, Dr. Marota, at just in a statement, at the time of the drafting of the text, it was clear that this issue of biological and chemical and nuclear weapons was deliberately left out in the interest of proceeding with it, because otherwise that debate would have gone on. There are people who had vested interests. There were very powerful states that had vested interests and, and would not allow that. They, they wanted to stick to their nuclear weapons. They would not allow a situation where their nuclear weapons would be you know, grabbed away from them or prohibited for that matter. Uh, they would also argue that there are other, of course, there are other instruments or conventions that were dealing with the issues of proliferation and the rest of the things about those weapons. And I've just stated what's important that I stated in your absence is that Belgium, I uh, remember Professor Sipathi talked about the Rome Conference review. Uh, that was 2010 in Kampala. Belgium trying to introduce another amendment uh, to be able to bring in the issue of chemical, um, biological, and nuclear weapons. But, mm -hmm. all right, uh, but uh, very clearly the debate was abandoned. There was, the arguments were already being brought again that why do you focus on biological and chemical weapons, which is easily available to the poor nations? And uh, definitely the, those who possess nuclear weapons will be very reluctant to, to give in to their weapons for their own reasons. So that debate was not sustainable at that particular time. It was abandoned for the sake of winding up and adopting the other things like crime of aggression, which were more pressing. So uh, that leaves us with a question. If at the time of drafting of the Rome Statute, the parties were not able to include, they expressly failed to include those uh, weapons to prohibit the weapons related to, specifically to use the terms biological, chemical, and nuclear weapons. And also at a subsequent review in Kampala, they failed to agree to put those. Can we argue that it was still the intention of the drafters to have uh, this text reflect those three classes of weapons? That is something debatable. Debatable because if I pick up what Professor said very clearly, uh, that how do you classify, how do you call poisonous gases? Are they not chemicals? How would you classify as, as uh, fiscating substances? Are they not chemicals? Or are they biological? And to add on another text, which I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that my colleague I might have made. When you look at uh, Article uh, 2A of, of the Rome Statute, let me just get the start article right from the Rome Statute. Yeah, the same. Uh, Article 8, Paragraph 2A, uh, 2, which talks of torture and inhuman treatment, including biological equipment. You see, how, how do you torture someone or have an inhuman treatment relating to biological experiments, uh, including biological experiments? If you're carrying out a biological experiment, there's a biological element already in there. You're using biological weapons or instrument or some items. So I'm trying to reinforce the argument of uh, uh, Professor Supati that really we have to look at what are these that we have in the text? Are they not biological? Perhaps it was a question of semantic uh, or linguistic agility as not to bring out clearly. There's lack of clarity as to whether to use weapons. What are we talking about when we say biological weapons? And here we are talking all chemical weapons. And yet, Article 8 clearly mentions items which would be classified gases, liquids, which are analogous, which as my, the professor put, would all be classified as uh, chemicals. That is a debatable issue. Uh, so that can be carried on to. But the issue again is, why would the drafters not include this expressly and just say, from now on, we prohibit the use or development of chemical and 
biological as well as nuclear weapons. But the other thing, the other argument would be, if they intended to have that, nothing would have stopped them from having that. But we know from history, from looking at the Trevor Preparatoire, that actually there was disagreement. Too. So the other question that comes out, can the court arrogate to itself jurisdiction? Can the International Criminal Court argue that, well, in our view, this is what the draft has taught, and make it an authoritative jurisprudential point? That is debatable too. Uh, can the court declare something that was clearly, even in the records, in the historical records, was denied, was actually kept off, was refused by those who are entrusted in drafting? Because those delegates are the epitome of their respective nations. They are the representative of the 120 nations that approved. I said that was the intention of those nations, those states that uh, approved the text in its current state. So th there are a lot of debatable issues that arise from this. And so as we proceed further, I would want us to look into the issue of, is there, just to summarize, notwithstanding that at the Rome, drafting of the Rome Statute initially, this particular mention of chemical, biological, nuclear was expressly excluded. And secondly, the German amendment proposal at the review conference was overtly rejected. Both of them on the ground that if that debate had to go on, it was very unlikely that those who hold nuclear power or weapons would not agree, would not succumb, that would not accede to any interests that would try to you know, deny them or the use uh, so, notwithstanding all those experiences, can we say, can the court or anybody interpreting the statute still argue that, well, that let's ignore that and take it in the context of what we have at the moment? So where do we get the authority to bark us if we take this argument? Which I agree, very persuasive. I would also say no, but what do we have? What are we dealing with? What was the spirit of the Rome Statute? Just to address issues that would bring, you know, the A, B, C, and C, and we have this so far. So that is something that has to be addressed effectively. If those failures were there manifesting, actually manifest in those two instances, can we still argue that we can still ignore those manifest uh, failures to introduce these items and to interpret the Rome Statute as if prohibits chemical weapons, it prohibits uh, biological weapons, and it prohibits the use of nuclear weapons. Can we say uh, the Rome Statute empowers, uh, because I'm going to refer you to another section, I think it's Article 120 something of the Rome Statute, 121 or something, I'll come to that. But can we now say the Rome Statute empowers the uh, ICC to decide to examine issues relating to chemical weapons, like in the Syria instance where there's violation, uh, overt violation in terms of uh, chemical weapons or whatever weapons it is uh, in question. Can the ICC on its own say, we have authority over all these issues? Would you think the pretrial chamber would be able to pass such an argument to ignore what the drafters in the 1998 statute time had actually overtly rejected to bring and which in 2010 did not bring in. Can they say, if we look at this context, the statute as a whole and the context and the spirit of this statute, we have the mandate to be able to you know, examine to have jurisdiction over these offenses. That is highly debatable. And we, we cannot simply ignore, we cannot say there's one way of arguing and agreeing to this. So that is what I throw back to you uh, on the, as professors. You may want to add on something on that. Uh, perhaps the other thing that I would want us to look at also, what is the status in all these argument, arguments that we have? We know we have, uh, the interpretation also of the International 
Court of Justice on the issue of these weapons. Uh, we'll come to look at that at a later time as well. I'll bring, in, uh, bring it up. But what is the nexus between all these provisions with those other conventions? We have just referred a little bit to the Geneva Convention, I mean, the, the Geneva Protocol to the Hague Convention. Uh, these are conventions that also deal with, they are also, we have um, the ones that deal with the Biological Weapons Convention. We have the nuclear pro proliferation arrangements between certain states. What is the context of the Rome Statute in the light of all these other conventions that also address the issue of nuclear weapons and biological weapons and chemical weapons? So this is what I put back to the professors and uh, I would be interested to hear your view. Thank you, Dr. Marotta, and thank you, Professor Sripathi, for a very erudite presentation. Over to thank you. you. Thank you, Professor Milton, for your participation. Um, I, will, I will pass the test to Professor uh, Sripathi. Ah, yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Milton, for your clear cut analysis of the Rome uh, Statute of Kadurov. What went into the deliberations when states wanted to include chemical weapons? Uh, clearly pointed out that chemical and biological weapons are easier to acquire than nuclear weapons because nuclear weapons um, is an expensive uh, affair, and only a few countries in the world have nuclear weapons, and, <coughs> and we have U.S., China, Russia and uh, Pakistan. It's a small country, but still possesses nuclear weapons. North Korea is which has nuclear weapons. Your country, and, India, has it as well? Yeah. North Korea, yes. North Korea. India. India has it. In India also, yes, yes. India is a nuclear yeah. power. Very, very powerful, but silent. <laughs> <laughs> no, but India adopts <laughs> a policy, no first use policy in case of nuclear weapons. What India says is we will not use nuclear weapons first. But if some state uses nuclear weapons against India, then India will retaliate. <laughs> <laughs> we have that policy. It's very clear. So, <laughs> and we also have CTBT, Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Yes as far as uh, nuclear weapons are concerned, where under this treaty, uh, testing of nuclear weapons under the ground, in the space, and underwater, all three kinds of testings are banned. States cannot test. Uh, but still we find France and China conducting tests and being permanent members of the Security Council of the United Nations. <laughs> <laughs> clear cut violation of the United Nations Charter. But as I said earlier, these are international politics. Yeah. Yes. India, of course, uh, conducted the three nuclear tests uh, about, say, 20 years back uh, in Pokhran, one of the states, uh, Rajasthan. We have a desert and the nuclear test way. But mostly India uses all its nuclear energy for civilian purposes, not for military purposes. Yeah. Now, coming to the Rome Statute itself, nowhere does the Rome Statute speak of nuclear weapons. Now, as pointed out by Professor Milton, with regard to the deliberation that went on during the 1998 negotiations of the Rome Statute, uh, biological and chemical weapons and nuclear weapons. If all three weapons, the use of all three weapons, if it amounts to a crime where the ICC can exercise jurisdiction, then no state would definitely act. So what the state should have done is taken in a phased manner. Initially consider use of chemical weapons as a war crime. 
in respect of which the ICC can exercise jurisdiction. Later on, in the second phase, include biological evidence as a warfare. And then lastly, they should have gone after the nuclear powers, saying that even use of nuclear weapons should be considered as a war. Because nuclear weapons have a more devastating effect than chemical and biological weapons. Yes. So, use of nuclear weapons also is a very serious crime. So, they should have done it in a phased manner rather than put all the things together. Because 100% sure that the states will not accept if all three are to be banned. So, it should have been done in a phased manner. And uh, moreover, coming to the Rome Statute itself, the Rome Statute does not anywhere mention nuclear weapons. It mentions poisonous, poison and poisonous gases, asphyxiating gases, and other liquids and materials analogous to such gases. Now, as far as nuclear weapons are concerned, they are developed from radioactive metals. Radioactive metals such as thorium, plutonium, and uh, uranium. So there is no mention of these radioactive metals anywhere in the Rome Statute. And the provisions that deal with chemical weapons are very, very limited. They have only two provisions in the whole of the statute that speak of not exactly chemical weapons because the words chemical weapons have not been used. Words similar to chemical weapons have been included in the Rome Statute. And the deliberations in 1998 when uh, the states uh, discussed is uh, a lot of issues were there, and uh, many states uh, wanted uh, chemical yeah. weapons, the use of chemical weapons to be a war crime under the Rome Statute. As I mentioned earlier, the states went back because simply banning chemical and biological weapons and not banning nuclear weapons was. Uh, just not possible. So, and since the uh, arguments and deliberations with regard to these chemical and nuclear weapons would only delay the coming into force of the Rome Statute if the deliberations had continued and states were eager that the Rome Statute should be uh, finished and then uh, established. So, probably they put aside this particular aspect of uh, chemical and biological weapons. Even during the Kampala amendments, uh, somehow the states managed to include those two amendments, that is 17 and 18 of Article yeah. 8, Clause 2, Clause B. And uh, they could not proceed further, uh, mainly because of the fact that there was another pressing matter as pointed out by Professor Milton, that of crime of aggression. The definition of the crime of aggression was more important at that point of time during the Kampala yes. And they devoted more time towards uh, discussions on the crime of aggression. So this again was sidelined. So that is a Today, uh, the Rome Statute is uh, having two provisions, but these two provisions also have their uh, drawbacks, very restricted, because one provision applies to international armed conflicts and the other provision applies to non-international armed conflicts. So while one which speaks of international armed conflicts speaks of weapons similar to chemical weapons, and the provision that deals with non-international armed conflicts, the list of crimes under this provision, does not mention anywhere the provisions that are contained in 8.2.E, 17 and 18. So 8.2.E 
which deals with non-international armed conflicts, does not speak of those crimes or use of those substances. So, I've discussed all this, and then we have this other issue of uh, certain states not being a party, but still, court can proceed against those states provided a referral is made by the Security Council to the court. And uh, in fact, uh, in the case of uh, Syria, though it is a non-international armed conflict when chemical weapons uh, were used, and uh, a reference was made to the Security Council, but uh, somehow two countries have uh, used veto. It is uh, China and uh, Russia, I think. yes. And uh, the resolution was defeated. And, uh, could not be made to the ICC to proceed against Syria. So, again, the court has come back to zero. The court is trying to do everything within its uh, powers, but uh, because of these inherent drawbacks within the statute of the court, is uh, not allowing the court to function smoothly and efficiently. So, at least in the future, there are a lot of, I think, definitely amendments must be made to the two provisions of the Rome Statute. Amendments must be made and the must be more clear, clearly stating that the use of chemical weapons, and they should give a long list of all the chemicals. Mm -hmm amount to chemical weapons. Again, if you mention one or two chemicals, the states might use other chemicals and say it is not part of the own statute. Yeah. Let us be comprehensive in drafting the provision in, by including all the chemicals that can be used for uh, developing chemical weapons. Similarly, biological weapons also, because as far as biological weapons are concerned, there is no mention very restrictive. So, biological weapons also should be listed in a very clear manner, a long list. Countries which use these chemical and biological weapons during warfare will not go spot free and they will come under the jurisdiction of the ICC. They have to. At least, we expect this from the court in the near future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Sipathi. There are a few things that I want to follow up immediately. Uh, you've mentioned, uh, with your permission, Dr. Marotta. Yes, yes continue, let, Professor Mitton. Uh, you have something to come in through? All right, let, let me just catch up yes. when it's still hot. Um, you've mentioned something which is clearly what I wanted to talk about earlier. So I thank you very much. The issue of definition. Uh, it is very critical if at any point we're going to have an amendment or drafting, the definition of these terms, the definition clause, the interpretation clause. As interpretation clause, yes. Should be able to bring out clearly what is meant by uh, chemical or what's meant by biological. That would be able to, because if you're going to look at the interpretation of the statute as a whole, there are so many elements that have to come into play. One of them would be the spirit. What's the spirit of that statute? Uh, when we look at Article 1 of uh, the Rome Statute, it talks of the courts. It would be interesting, before I even mention that article, it would be interesting to really see the reasoning of the ICC, of the judges, should such a matter come before it. I, I suspect that one of the reasoning could be the court would want to argue or put, there could be an argument that when you look at Article 1 of the Rome Statute, it says the court shall have jurisdiction over persons for more serious crimes. There are two things here, serious crime as one, serious crimes that are of concern to the international community. So the question would be, do we consider um, chemical weapons the use of chemical weapons. And we also we have to be careful whether what is being uh, prohibited here, is it the use or the possession? Just as I gave the uh, example of a cobra, 
Are we prohibiting the use? Because it seems even in these two elements you're talking about, what is prohibited there is just the use. Nobody's prohibiting the possession. Nothing. It doesn't talk about possession. But then stroke back to this Article 1. The court could still argue, just hypothetical for, you know, for analysis, for argument purposes, for analysis purposes. It could argue that, well, the statute establishes us to be able to have jurisdiction over persons for one, more serious crimes, and two, of concern to the international community. So can we use these two elements to interpret as to whether we have jurisdiction over chemical weapons, nuclear weapons? So the question is, uh, are nuclear weapons, the use of nuclear weapons, a serious crime? Would it be really serious to, um, to launch a nuclear weapon onto mass you know, populations? The answer would be positive. It would not be in the negative anyway. Uh, then they would also ask themselves, is it an offense that is of concern to the international community? The answer also is in affirmative. I'm just using this uh, hypothetically for you know, analysis purposes, uh, argument purposes, that yes, so in that case, we have authority. We have the jurisdiction over these pers persons who are using these items. But those are all debatable. Now, the other element which I want to introduce uh, which I did not mention in the first instance. What is, as we look at this, we would question ourselves, what is the role of the customary international, what's the position of customary international law? What's the role of this customary? Where the opinion risk comes in? Uh, how does the issue of nuclear weapons, biological, chemical, falling in the context of the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. That also needs to be looked at. And uh, another thing I wanted to make clarification was, okay, definition I've talked about that. It's very clear that if um, to avoid ambiguity, uh, to avoid absurdity in any interpretation, uh, it would be critical that any amendment that we put in would clearly bring in what is entailed under the umbrella of uh, chemical weapons, uh, even nuclear weapons, because if we, the way Professor put it already, uh, Dilpati, uh, Sripati, sorry, uh, some of the uses of nuclear weapons or nuclear energy is for civilian uses, harm, harmless purposes. So it's very clear we cannot have a blanket prohibition of nuclear. It's critical that we should have very clear definition and interpretation clause, or with it, that clause can also be within the Article 8 itself and interpret and say for the purposes of this article, the following words would mean this and that and that and that and include this. It can either say includes this or would mean this. Usually in drafting language we use, we choose which one depending on what we want to embrace within that term. So that is very important as we look forward because I can see that it will not end in future without this being brought in expressly within the statute at some point. And talking about that, I need to clarify also that actually the amendment which the Belgians brought before the 2010 uh, Review Commission. Kampala amendments. Yeah, Kampala, actually, the Kampala Review amendments. What the Belgium state brought, the amendment they, pro they, they proposed was only to amend to include chemical and biological weapons. And the reason there was contest and resistance to this was that there was no mention of nuclear weapons. So that has to be very clear. They did not, the amendment did not talk about specifically about nuclear weapons. So the argument was why, why are we leaving out this? Because then it would not be fair to, to bring in those amendments would mean clearly targeting only the poor countries that would not be able to afford the nuclear weapons. But we know that even the lobbying and even the presence of the, the United States was present. The fact that it not signed the agreement, I mean, it, it did not ratify, it was still present uh, as an, more of an observer in that conference and was there to be able to see that the interests are protected. So we'd expect resistance from the nuclear powers. The arguments would have gone on, so they decided to shell them altogether. But it's clear to note that Belgium had somehow omitted 
on the issue of nuclear. You didn't give emphasis to nuclear. But that was the argument that really, why can't we then also bring in the nuclear weapons as a prohibition? The other point is, as I said over and over again, if you look at the statute, it only prohibits the employment, which is the use or the application, as you may. It does not tell us that the development of this is prohibited. In my view, a very comprehensive, if we seek to block or forestall something that is a mischief, we should be able to address the issue of um, the development of that particular prohibited item, not just the uh, employment of it. Okay, the other issue we need to look at is how we position the non-proliferation treaty of the 1968 in all this context. I've just asked how do we deal with, with customer international uh, law in respect of this. Now we are talking about non-proliferation treaty. Uh, we are also saying how, where do we put in the biological weapons convention and all other conventions, the chemical weapons that we put in. Uh, the context is very critical. So uh, it is clear also that we should re-emphasize that so far, the ICC, going by this, it can be argued it has no jurisdiction really over these offenses at the moment. Any offense that relates to use, because these offenses could have been generated by other conventions or other statutes, or internal domestic legislation anyway. But the question is, can the ICC argue or deny itself jurisdiction in the light of Article 1 of the Rome Statute? That's a question we need to look at as well. And I, I just said that Article simply, there are two elements I'm removing out of that Article 1 for purpose singling out. That is uh, the most serious, it has jurisdiction of most serious, most serious crimes. So the question would be the use of nuclear weapons and the use of uh, uh, biological and chemical, they're not serious. Two, uh, which is of concern to the international community. Are they of concern? Yes. All these answer in the affirmative. And so can the ICC argue that in the light of that, if we are going to look at the, the provisions in Article 8 and apply it with Article 1, do we have the jurisdiction? Okay. So uh, it's clear. We also need to look at Article 121. But for now, let me just state that uh, the arguments advanced by Professor Tripathi are very, very uh, informative. And the analysis should continue to proceed in the light of those areas. Uh, let me hand you back to uh, Dr. Marota. Yes, um, uh, thank you, professors, for sharing with us your, <laughs> your uh, thoughts and your experience in, in, in the matter. Also, what I want to add is um, related to cost customary law, is that um, is that uh, uh, also um, what have, um, I was I was thinking about a rat rat brush. This uh, um, German uh, scholar that when uh, we had in the past uh, Nuremberg trials um, for uh, getting in. In, prosec in prosecuting the, the Nazis uh, regime, uh, he, develop he developed a formula that is called the Rush um, the Rushford formula um, that was um, um, the the, the Rushford formula proposed the notion that positive law must be regarded as a contrary to justice and not apply where the inconsistency between statute law and justice is so intolerable that the former must give way to the latter. Um, uh, this, this, this also this concept was applied in, in the German federal constitution referred to the formula in its judgment in Strasbourg and Kester in October 1996. The question at issue was whether the accused former senior officials of the former uh, German Democratic Republic charged with the in, indictment to commit intentional homicide for the responsibility in order in the shooting and killing by border guards of persons trying to flee from the GDR at the material time, which did not make them liable to criminal prosecution. The defendants submitted that holding them crim criminal liable would run contrary to the ban on the defendants submitted that holding 
then criminally liable would run contrary to the ah, I was related to retro to to the retroactive application of criminal law on, under article uh, at that moment 100 uh, 302 of the German Constitution laying down nullum criminal nullum criminal principle the principle said that there is no crime uh, if there is uh, no set of law related to the crime uh, the court in this case dismissed the defendant's submission among other things it noted that the prohibition the prohibition on retroactive law derived its justification from the special trust reposed to criminal statutes enacted by a democratic legislature respecting fundamental rights so here what i want to uh, point out is that um uh, under the Rajput principle that was used in the nuremberg trials and afterwards part of of the foundation of uh, of the custom and jurisprudence and doctrine in the, in the through the German scholars, we should use it also um, here in in the ICC related to uh, chemical and biological weapons. Um, I, I I think that uh, trying to make that approach and all the states around the world or even a few ones try to uh, to hold uh, this uh, idea of being more uh, specific related to this type of crime, biological and chemical, it will aid in the future also for stopping uh, uh, the nuclear um, uh, under, the, under the nuclear, I mean, there is the, I mean, there the, this there is this clock that is called uh, this name the uh, um, the the midnight uh, it's called the clock there is there is a uh, the atomic clock bomb it's called uh, five minutes to midnight so only if you go to the web page of of this clock you will see that we are like one minute before the, the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <You go. laughs> Yes, I mean, I see this web page is very amazing. The last hour. <laughs> yes, the web went to one minute. So, um, so I, I, I think that if some countries in, that are now part of, of, of the Security Council of the UN try uh, to make another uh, uh, Kampala Convention trying to discuss this issue related to, to massive destruction arma uh, armament, it will be very helpful uh, for, for example, India, Pakistan, uh, and all the countries that they have uh, nuclear materials that can be, as Professor Shipati has uh, enlightened us, that can be like what, is, what they use in India is for more for energy, for having a uh, power station and, and, and be used for that, not for uh, a weapon and trying in some point to disarm all the countries uh, around the globe uh, with the nuclear uh, power of mass destruction. I, I think that, that th there should be an, an initiative, I don't know, from any, in any country around the world, uh, trying to have an, an honest uh, view of, of disarming uh, uh, the, the biological weapons and the chemical ones, including the the um, uh, the nuclear that are considered with a chemical weapon. So that's my what I want to share uh, with you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Marota. Um, that was good. That was uh, you always giving us pertinent live situation. Now, there's something I mentioned. You remember I mentioned uh, Article One Twenty One of the wrong statute, I said we'll get back to it. That mm -hmm. particular article. Uh, but before I go on, I think it seems that no one of us is in a hurry, but if one wants to, I thought that limitation of one and a half hours may not be working for us. I don't know what you think, Dr. Marota. Yes, I'm, 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 I haven't heard the... Yeah, I said, are you with me? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm here with you. I was saying that limitation I was trying to indicate of uh, one and a half hours may not be working. So sometimes this discourse becomes, you know, very more interesting towards the end. All right. Um, we'll allow ourselves to exhaust whatever we want to exhaust. 
Article 121 of the Rome Statute, uh, generally, if you look at it, uh, generally deals with the amendment procedures. Yes, correct. Uh, yes. So uh, I talked about it. I said we need to have a look at it as well. It provides for amendments of the statute. Uh, if you look at um, uh, Article 1, after the expiry of seven years from the entry into force of the statute, any state may propose amendments. That's why we didn't have amendments until you remember the first review conference in Kampala in 2010. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that it provides also for such uh, that uh, the text of the proposed amendment shall be submitted to the Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, who shall prompt the circular all states. Um, the other important date within this article is the issue, I mean, figure is the issue of three months, at least three months from the date of notification, uh, the Assembly of State Parties, the ASP, uh, at the next meeting shall be able by majority present vote over it. And it's important to note that some of the decisions would be moving by way of consensus. But where consensus fails, then uh, two thirds of the majority will be able to deal with certain amendments. We, we are talking about this to be able to alert the states who are watching and our viewers is critical because we advise states also on matters of international criminal justice. Um, the other point which is critical to note here is where consensus cannot be reached, it will require two thirds of majority. I've just mentioned that as well as uh, if it takes one year, or just to read it clearly, apart from that, we would have a review conference. The review conference can be convened as it was in 2010, but only after one year, after, sorry, yes, after um, the first point was seven years. After the seven years had elapsed, then I was trying to explain that that is the reason we never saw any proposals until after the Kampala Amendment. And so people are to contend. Probably the rationale there was to allow for states to evaluate and reassess and see the proposals in action. But again, we, we see that all these amendments do not just proceed general. They're not general terms. There is Article 5, 6, 7, 8, which of course we know deal with the crimes, the, uh, the crimes and the elements of the crimes uh, prescribed under the Rome Statute. Uh, you look at that, an amendment to this shall enter into force for those states which have accepted the amendment one year after they have deposited their instruments. Okay, um, my interest is one thing. All these questions, all these arguments we have put across, maybe we'll also want to hear from Brian, uh, the researcher he just told me he's been having, how are you, Brian? We didn't even greet you uh, deep into the, are you okay, you can hear us? Yeah, um, uh, you're audible, sir. Thank you very, very much. Am I audible? All right. So uh, I'll soon hand over to you. So get ready. We want to hear your views. I'm sure you prepared something. But the, the arguments, some of which went on in your absence, were that uh, the statute does not bring out clearly that it prohibits the, the use of uh, biological, chemical, or nuclear weapons. What we saw as Dr. Pris, uh, Professor Sripathi put very, very clearly and elaborately is arguments about how they talk about gases. And anybody will say, but well, these are actually chemical weapons. An interpretation is clear. You cannot deny that. You cannot simply say that actually they are not chemical weapons uh, or they are not biological for that matter. So we looked at a number of analysis in your absence, in your short absence. But the point here is, does the court, the International Criminal Court, have jurisdiction over matters relating to chemical weapons or biological weapons or nuclear weapons? We also said that the uh, amendments introduced by Belgium, uh, proposed by Belgium to be introduced at the Rome conference, um, rather at the review conference in Kampala. But they proposed that we should be able to ban chemical and biological weapons. However, those who are present contested that proposition because it did not talk about nuclear weapons. And it was argued that nuclear weapon, it appears it was favoring only the richest states like India who can afford to have nuclear weapons. And uh, you know, the biological and chemical weapons are largely for 
the less impetuous. Those are the lot of arguments that went on. Uh, in the end, what I'm saying is we should be able to ask ourselves, can really the International Criminal Court argue that in the light of Article 1, which says it shall exercise jurisdiction over persons for the most serious crimes, one, and which are of concern to the international community, two, but we see that all these biological, chemical, and nuclear weapons are serious. We can, nobody can argue that they're not serious crimes. No one would argue that they're, they're not of concern to international community. Can the ICC use that particular interpretation? And in the light of uh, the chemical weapon, because there's, it could interpret that since it's prohibiting this, rather, I mean, one would argue at the pretrial conference when they're probably trying to establish jurisdiction, the prosecution could argue that, for instance, that, well, uh, Article 1 empowers the court to be able to look into this. Two, they could argue also that uh, since there have been mention of these chemical weapons, analogous liquids, we can also argue that the other, it was the intention to bring in the other items, which are chemical and biological. And the other thing could be in this particular argument was that at the time of the drafting, it was clear that there was an attempt to bring in these chemicals, biological, nuclear weapons to be incorporated, but those attempts were thwarted and that's why they don't exist. And so if the court proceeds, it will be arguing contra to the intention of the drafters. These are the kind of discourse that have been going on. Uh, but before we go to the conclusive things, we would want to hear if you have anything uh, to add on. Let me just hand you back to Dr. Marota to run that part of it. Yes, Dr. Marota, back to you. Probably you want to bring in um, Mr. Brian. Okay, Brian. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Um, am I audible? I'm having network problems today. Uh, that other side is very expensive. Um, um, I, have, I have two submissions. Uh, firstly, um, uh, on the issue whether or not the International Court will have jurisdiction, is going to be a matter of um, which method of in, uh, interpretation is going to be employed by the court. So if the court is willing to take a, a purposive interpretation to say that the ways that are used in Article 8, uh, would, then it would mean that uh, the court would have jurisdiction. But if the court is going to use a more restrictive approach, then it would mean that the court uh, does not have jurisdiction. So the most interesting clash is going to be um, the fact that if you look at Article you, Article Thirty Two of the Rome Rome, no, no, no. Rome Yes, we can if hear you. You look at uh, Article Thirty Two of the Vienna Convention. It says that yes, it says that the intention of the of the drafters should not be the primary uh, requirement that is used to, to check whether or not. Um, or to check the intention of the state parties, but rather we must look at the context or the text of the, the, uh, the international instrument. So if we are going to interpret the text of the international instrument, it can be argued that it had uh, the required or the required intention to include uh, a biological and chemical and chemical weapons. On the other hand, I, one may also argue that looking at the intention of the parties at the time. Because if you can look clearly uh, throughout history, uh, it was not the first time the international community had said and talked about uh, international uh, and talked about uh, biological and chemical weapons. They said in 1907, they said in 1925, they said in 1972, and they also said in 1968, in which they, they tried to show their intention uh, to keep this biological and biological and chemical weapons. So the question is going to be, if during the drafting of the Rome Statute in 98, where uh, countries had declared that intention that they would not want, they do not want uh, biological weapons, biological and chemical weapons to be included, can it be argued that 
then the industrial oh sorry the uh international criminal court has jurisdiction so it's a matter of weighing the two arguments and uh, seeing whether on which one uh, will subsist but i am of the opinion that it should have jurisdiction looking at a more progressive interpretation of the of the statute to say that if those ways are included in article 8 then it mean that um the international court should have jurisdiction thank you yes that is very brilliant uh, dr uh, brian uh, i want just to quickly talk about the uh, article 32 of the vienna convention on the law of treaties um it's true that all of us would want to be able to look at how the context of the statute is or any instrument that is being interpreted. But something I want to put across, the modern interpretation of Article 32 of Vienna Convention uh, does not altogether throw away the issue of travail. It's not hostile, actually. That interpretation is not hostile to travail preparatoire as it is. Uh, one would say it's very helpful for us to be able to contextualize, but in the light of uh, how we look at Article 32 lately. It's not that it is really hostile to the fact that we should go back to the, uh, you know, to be able to see what was the intention of the, the parties at the time of drafting. More so, nothing more, nothing less. That's very critical, but it's very important, as you put it, like all of us agree even with Professor uh, Sripathi, that we should be able to contextualize. What is, that's why I brought in the issue of Article 1 of uh, the, Rome Statute, and also just Article 8 itself, which talks about this, uh, the, the question of weapons should be construed uh, to give it a purposive uh, you know, object. Um, I just wanted to warn that we should not totally, we should be careful not to altogether abandon uh, the idea of the travel, especially and notably where it was controversial and over repeatedly the same an attempt to introduce a particular provision uh, failed altogether, like in this case. At the drafting itself, uh, it, it is very clear that uh, there was an attempt and which was expressly denied uh, at the very beginning. It was abandoned altogether. The use of nuclear weapon, uh, chemical weapon, biological, they were not included. And a further attempt in 2010 by Belgium to introduce the same biological and nuclear weapon very clearly documented. They were rejected on the argument that uh, why ignore nuclear? And the reason was that uh, it favors mostly the, the rich. And so altogether it was abandoned. So the question would be, why would a tribunal proceed with impunity to ignore what has been repeatedly re-emphasized at the time? So uh, in instances where we cannot fall back to the travel preparatura, it's very clear that the court would always want to look into the context, the purpose, and as I said, the spirit of the, of the instrument itself by looking at Article 1, where I gave the example that we need to, uh, when you look at Article 1, the court shall have jurisdiction over persons uh, for most serious crimes, one. So uh, uh, nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, biological weapons, no serious crime. It would also go a step ahead and concern itself whether it is of international, it's concerned to the international community. These are instruments, approaches that can be used in construction of text to be able to proceed. And that's why I'm putting across, can the ICC actually proceed to, uh, to preside over? Can the pretrial chamber uh, rule if presented? Because we don't have any authoritative jurisprudence so far on this matter. And one could easily introduce it. We could actually champion it as a center inspire one of the states to introduce that, that motion. We can ask for amendment to be introduced. We can lobby around, because that is why we are here. We can lobby so that states can propose it to the uh, ASP and go on through that process and have it introduced. So I, I want us to just be very careful. That was a very brilliant point you brought in, that the purposive idea of, you know, it's clear to look at what was the purpose and the spirit but I just wanted to warn that uh, the fact that the literal interpretation, the literal interpretation should not altogether ignore. The whole thing is about we contextualize case by case uh, 
uh, no, we give factual interpretation to a given case at a given time. This particular one, we have well-documented rejection of the use of those terms at the time of drafting. So that, that was very good. Uh, and just remember that uh, Article 32 of the Vienna Convention Law Treaty is not hostile to uh, Traveur Preparatura. It's not hostile. It will only come into play depending on how. If nothing was ever mentioned about these weapons at all, if there was not even an attempt, would comfortably say the court may have jurisdiction. That's why we keep questioning ourselves, can the court attempt? And that's the question I still put across. Do you think the ICC can proceed to uh, rule the pretrial chamber for that matter if presented with facts for analysis purposes? He presented with facts trying to introduce the issue about uh, uh, weapons that have been prohibited. Can it give itself, can it rule that it has the power to be able to uh, preside over? Does it have jurisdiction over this matter? That is the question. So if you look at 121, as I said, just for the purpose of the amendment procedures. Then uh, if you have looked at the 1996 ICJ advisor opinion, I'm not sure that any of you have had the benefit of looking at this, but uh, the advisor opinion on the legality of threat of use of nuclear weapons as a war crime under Article 8. So uh, just try to question, try to examine the ruling, the advisor opinion that was granted by the International Criminal, uh, the International Court of Justice, not Justice. Justice. Yeah, Court of Justice, 1996. That one would be very instrumental. Uh, but as a whole, as we said, the issue of... Uh, yeah, there's also the proposition by Mexico at the ASP, on the 8th Assembly, on the amendment of the use of threat to use of nuclear weapons. Uh, that will also need to be examined. So back to you, Dr. Marota. I think somebody else wants to proceed. Okay, uh, thank you very much for for reminding us, rem reminding us of the um, of the uh, legality of the threat of use of, ne of nuclear weapons uh, that was mentioned um, more than twenty years ago uh, by the International Court of Justice. Um, trying to, I think it was. Uh, um, there, to our viewers, you can you can you can you can check um, more deeply the information in the webpage of the International Court of Justice uh, slash case slash ninety five. So it's important that we that our audience and, and uh, our participants at some point uh, take a look to to the communication of the I of the International Court of Justice related to the use of nuclear weapons and that and that can be the 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 the, the point of the iceberg related to the other um, uh, mass destruction weapons related to to chemicals and to bi biological ones okay um so at that at this point um just for 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 uh ending uh this panel I, one of you want to add something else that we must miss related to this uh, discussion? Uh, I would like to add one point. Okay, yes, you have the desk, Professor. <coughs> yeah. Uh, on this, Professor Milton has given us a very good analysis of the provisions of the Rome Statute. He has established a link between Article 1 and then Article 8. And also a link between the provisions of the Rome Statute and the Convention on the Law of the Treaties as far as interpretation is concerned. Uh, but I sincerely think that uh, if the court is going to proceed against persons who make use of chemical weapons in warfare, it is not enough to merely proceed against persons who use chemical weapons or nuclear weapons, even biological weapons. It is also important for the court to 
to establish its jurisdiction over those persons, whether artificial or natural. Because chemical weapons, nuclear weapons, and uh, biological weapons are manufactured in factories, companies, yeah. which constitute artificial persons. No doubt these companies and factories are headed by individuals, but even the country where the factories are stationed, if they manufacture and supply these weapons to other countries, should be brought under the jurisdiction of them. It is not enough to say that only the use of chemical weapons will invite the jurisdiction of the Pope. Even the manufacture and supply of chemical weapons shall be under the jurisdiction of the court, should be under the jurisdiction of the court. Uh, because uh, during the ISIS and uh, Syrian conflict, uh, it was found that uh, ISIS acquired chemical weapons from depots in Iraq. And at the same time, the Syrian forces also acquired chemical weapons from some of the Western powers, Western countries. So, although these countries do not have the capability of manufacturing chemical weapons or biological weapons, they are acquiring it from other countries. So, the countries that also manufacture and supply should be brought under the jurisdiction of the court. That is very important. If the court has to curb the use of chemical weapons in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Tipati, for your presentation. I'm uh, sharing us that, that point of view that, that, that indeed is very important that the ICC should, uh, in these cases, have uh, jurisdiction. Uh, also, <clears throat> as you mentioned, on uh, and, and Syria, uh, we need to see and to study how Germany is prosecuting uh, uh, the Syrians uh, who had committed uh, war crimes in that country. And also, it will be very important also for Brian and for us and for our audience uh, to do some research uh, through the criminal statutes of each country, how they uh, regulate, or if not, uh, the use of uh, uh, this kind of, of, of weapons within their own their own legislation is very important. Hence, at some, some at some point, if I don't know if a country, I, I don't have to check it, but I'm going to do the research, has in his own uh, criminal statute or criminal code this uh, regulation um, like a terrorist attack or something like that related to biological and uh, chemical weapons under universal jurisdiction at some point um, anyone could, could be trial um, in this particular country. For example, if Germany, I, I don't have checked the German, the German code, uh, the German um, criminal code, but I'm, I'm doing as an example, for example, if, uh, uh, or Spain that they bound under universal jurisdiction, they can um, think it out of the box, uh, use uh, now that in, that in Germany, Germany under universal jurisdiction is prosecuting uh, two war criminals. Uh, probably they can use universal jurisdiction to go, go forward in the aspect of, of chemical weapons against uh, civilians. So I agree with you, Professor, and it's important and to share uh, to do this kind of research, also for Brian, he's uh, his, uh, beginning in, in the field of the research to, to check if if Germany has in his own, I'm going to check it also if they have uh, in their own uh, legislation or something related to the use of, of chemical and biological weapons. Okay, um, if that's it for us, uh, I pass the venue uh, to Professor Milton for closing today's uh, debate. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Marotta. But before I can close, first probably, uh, 
Mr. Rampane has something to say, or Professor yeah. Dr. Thank you very much, Dr. Marota, for that. Uh, but I would want to find out if uh, Dr. Prefer, uh, Professor Sripati has something else to add on. Or Dr. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you. I know there's always something still left, uh, and uh, I think we shouldn't thwart that. I know we, we indicated the limit time, but I can see it's not working. Sometimes yeah. we need to drain these intellectuals, right? <laughs> they don't go back with everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our viewers Milk, on this. <laughs> mil milking them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is a disservice to allow somebody going back to law to be very useful. All these contributions are very brilliant. And when I listen to them, I just, I can listen the whole day. <laughs> So, Prof, you have anything for us? Just feel free. And remember also there was the issue we said about the ICC, uh, US trying to come up against the prosecutor. If you have anything general, you can still talk about that. The ICC just two days ago uh, banged the ICC prosecutor, I mean the US. With, with I, the, I, I want also to bring something to the desk that maybe we can discuss it um in the following weeks but it have some kind of relations about what we are discussing right now is the action of the netherlands in canada yes. before the i for, before the international court of justice to go uh, forward uh the case of the Ro rohingya and uh, uh um uh yeah, trials yeah. against uh yes because they are being um spread and there have been killed back in Asia and, and I think probably under this uh, um, I think it was uh, on Tuesday that they that they made the communication um, the Netherlands and, and, and Canada before the uh, before uh, before the International Court of Justice of these European human rights violations probably uh, as they, they, they decided to go uh, pro uh, after uh, after these uh, incidents of human rights. Also, I mean, it can happen um, in by other countries to go like this against Syria. That, that is like a case that they're using chemical weapons. So under customary law, it can bring more power for the ICC for taking uh, uh, future decisions. Uh, in future cases related to um, to crimes against humanity using uh, chemical and biological weapons. That, that's what I I I, I, I try to to put on the desk. Uh, however, we can the Rohingya case and what is Canada and the Netherlands doing in the International Criminal Court of Justice. We can discuss this in another moment. But I think was it have some kind of relation the Two countries uh, that have uh, worked uh, for the human rights uh, uh, around the globe uh, in these past 50 years, uh, they are trying to 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 make a trend uh, to prosecute the uh, crimes that sometimes the ICC doesn't have jurisdiction for doing that, or or there are some politics behind that they don't want to use some of the. I mean, they have to do in the the devil's advocate uh, premises, but I think uh, we should, uh, uh, in this point, uh, try to mention that, that uh, countries uh, under the principle of democracy and the prevail of the human race and the human rights of all the people around the globe uh, under the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights, they can. Uh, of us under natural law, uh, positive law, uh, try to uh, make this happen at some point. So let's see what's going on in Germany uh, relating to the prosecution, the prosecuting of these Syrians that committed war crimes, and if they can open the window of what we are discuss, uh, what we are, what we are discussing right now. Okay, Professor. Uh, anyone else to wants to add us? Yeah, one last statement. Yeah. Okay. The prohibition on the use of chemical weapons today is 
recognized as a part of international customary law. It has become a rule of international customary law. So states cannot afford to violate rules of customary law. Very powerful. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Mr. Brennan, I, I liked your analysis of uh, the Vienna Convention on Law Treaties in terms of interpretation. But there's something I want to, you see, I, I came in, when I brought in that point, it's not that I was contesting your, the point that you put across. Professor Sripathi and Dr. Marot, I think will agree that that was very good analysis uh, of Article 32 of the Vienna Convention, the Law of Treaties with regard to interpretation of statutes. But we also want to, don't lose, uh, what I talked also has connection with uh, Article 31, uh, paragraph four, which gives emphasis to the fact that uh, the drafting history, the travail should not be ignored. But I wanted to mention one thing, even when the drafters, now we are talking about the drafters of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties itself, not of any other text. Even at the time the Vien, the drafters of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties were working on these provisions, they were not totally unaware of the complications that come along with looking at the history of, uh, of the drafting of a particular test. They included it, particularly Article 31.4 talks about having recourse to the drafting history, the travail. So uh, they knew that that is very problematic in itself, and we all agree, because how do you establish at the time, because there were arguments that even somebody can put in any mischievous in the process, not necessarily mischievous, but for their own intention, because people have interests when they come into the table. And should we use such perverted interests to be able to interpret the current statute? No. So the, the problems related to, there are a lot of problems related to going into the history. You seem to be going out of network. Are you okay, Brian? You can hear us. Yes, I can hear you, sir. Yeah, I can see you have complications. Yes, we yes. just wanted to commend you for the good job you're doing, and uh, you should continue uh, doing that uh, as you share with the professors. And I want you to be very keen on what the other professors are presenting as well. There's so much to learn from the experience of Professor Sripathi. You must have noticed that yourself. There's so much that he has garnered, uh, so take advantage of that. I, I just wanted to reinforce Article 31 for talking about that. But then why I brought in that, just as I said in retrospect, uh, the 32 itself is not hostile to, as a whole, it's not hostile to the issue of history. It's very critical. But we said, my conclusion was that each case should be handled with its own peculiar characteristics. We should have factual interpretation of a given case and draw a conclusion different from the other depending on what we have obtaining. And we emphasize that with regard to this particular one, Article 8, it seems it's very clear that a lot of attempts were made which are very manifest. It was so serious that if those controversial, uh, controversial arguments were to continue, the Rome Statute could have been delayed, maybe it could not have been passed, simply because there would be no agreement or consensus on that issue of nuclear biological and chemical weapons. And we've seen that the same thing repeated itself seven years later, I mean, at the 2010 uh, Kampala Review Conference, that again, that same obstacle, that same argument recurred, and they abandoned it on account of winding up with that conference. Because had they picked it up to its logical conclusion, they would still have had a problem. So it's important also for our viewers to note that uh, they much as the convention gives all this, and there are various canons, by the way. It's not just a literal interpretation or looking at the intention of the drafters. Uh, the intention of the drafters becomes critical. That's why when we look at uh, Article 6 of the Rome Statute, uh, you would want to talk about um, the intent and knowledge, you see. So sometimes we glean the intent and knowledge thing because we want to see that whoever is being committed had the intent and knowledge. But then, how do we get to that? We also still have to grow back. We look, there a lot of factors are involved. So I want to commend your, your contribution. And as usual, uh, Professor 
Sri Pati, that was very powerful. Uh, you've introduced the issue of customary international. Thank you. Uh, and a lot of other things. I want to, can I uh, add something? Yes, yes. That is why we are trying to motivate you to come up with anything. Go ahead. All right. Yes, uh, from from my submission, like 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 had I had argued, it's going to, it looks like there are two schools of thoughts for those who are for um, the idea that the ICC would have jurisdiction, arguing purposive interpretation, and for those who are arguing against it, uh, arguing the intention of the parties. So, arguing uh, for anti or for the for the argument that the ICC does not have jurisdiction. One may also add the fact that the, the, there, is a lot of, there are a lot of inadequacies in terms of uh, firstly, the monitoring and secondly, the inspections. Because if you can look clearly to the, uh, the convention before that, which it clearly stated that it had created an organization which was responsible for firstly uh, monitoring and secondly, it was also responsible for inspections. So one may also argue that the inadequacies in the uh, in the room, in the room statute may mean that uh, there was never intention to to include to include those uh, biological and chemical weapons. So it's going to be really uh, two schools of thought thought slashing and uh, as you had already stated, I think. Um, the one that extrapolates on the intention of the parties at the end of the day. We like seem to have to, lost you. Okay. To, to, to win the debate. All right. We seem to be losing you, Mr. Rampani. But that was good. That's good addition. Prof, do you have anything else to state, Professor Sripathi? Thank you, Mr. Rampani. Uh, yeah. A parting shot. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let's get that parting <laughs> shot. <laughs> See, when we speak of the jurisdiction of the ICC, the ICC derives its jurisdiction and powers from the statute. Yeah. So the statute must be clear as far as its provisions are concerned. Otherwise, the ICC will be in a realm of doubt whether it should exercise jurisdiction or not. For instance, if you take a domestic setup in a country, at least in India, we have the Supreme Court and the High Courts in various states. Now, these courts are known as constitutional courts because they derive their jurisdiction and powers from the Indian constitution. And the constitution is very, very clear. So I expect this kind of clarity in the Rome statute also, so that the ICC can clearly establish jurisdiction and subsequently exercise that jurisdiction. That is very important because as we had discussed this whole evening regarding those two provisions, Article 8 to B, uh, 17 and 18, <clears throat> though the provisions are there in the statute, there is no clarity. <clears throat> there is no clear cut definition as to what a chemical is and what a chemical weapon is. So these kind of uh, doubts in the provisions of the Rome Statute will put a lot of difficulties on the court while exercising jurisdiction because the prosecutor also will have a lot of difficulties in convincing the defendant state when prosecuting the state, he has to be clear in his ideas, saying that these are the crimes that the state has committed and you are guilty of this. So there should be a kind of uh, concreteness in the arguments of the prosecutor and that can be, and that is possible only when the provisions of the statute are clear. 
otherwise the prosecutor will always be in doubt and which is not a good thing for the ICC. This is what I would like to say. Well done, Prof. Uh, just with your parting shot, we still don't want you to go. Let me just ask you one thing. Let me get your view, but also the other uh, panelists will be able to come in if they wish. Um, the question is, if for any reason, one would argue for analysis purposes, that if the states who are present during the Rome Statute, drafting negotiation and drafting the 1998, and those subsequently present at the review conference in uh, 2010, did not want uh, the use of chemical or biological weapons uh, to be made criminal, if they intended that that is the position, this for analysis purposes, um, do you think they would still have, or would, do you think they would have made sure that not even the use of poisonous asphyxiating be allowed to find its way into the statute. I'm trying to get back to what Professor was saying, which I agreed with really, that uh, the interpretation clause was very critical to, you know, for the avoidance of doubt and to avert any ambiguity in the interpretation or construction of the terms. Do you think the ease with which these terms were allowed into the uh, statute, does it give leeway that possibly there was hope that they should finally want to use biological. What, what is here really? Why do we have the term poisonous gases and analogous liquids in the statute? While not necessarily, because we know these are actually chemicals and, and they're biological, some of them are biological. Uh, why would we still have this? If they do not want anything to do with this, why wouldn't they have altogether objected? What is your take on this? What do you think about this? Um, the manner they were using as asphyxiating poisonous and other gases. What, what do you think by extrapolation would have been their intentions to allow only these and not altogether forget about chemicals? And I'm trying to look at this with a view to seeing the future. Do we even have any success, possibilities, chances of success that states would agree to ever introducing anything like nuclear? So, what are your views? It's not very no, no. As, as I mentioned earlier, as I yeah. mentioned earlier, <clears throat> the provisions must be clear. When we speak of chemical weapons, if the provision says that use of chemical weapons shall amount to a war crime, then there should be a clear cut expansion of what is a chemical weapon, what are the chemicals that go into the weapon the various chemicals. Now, the two basic chemicals that are used in chemical weapons is sodium fluoride and potassium fluoride. And apart from these two chemicals, there are so many other chemicals that are used for manufacturing chemical weapons. So I would say that the provision should be more clear. There should be a clarity so that a defendant state which makes use of these weapons cannot use the black unit in the provisions of the statute to escape liability. The provision should be designed in such a manner that the defendant state cannot have any possibility of escaping liability. That is what I want from the provisions of the statute. Powerful indeed, powerful argument. Uh, back to you, Brian, just before we wind up. Uh, talking about canons of interpretation. Are you with me? Um, Mr. Ramapane? Uh, we seem to have lost him now altogether. All right, on, on that note, Dr. Marota, do you think there's anything before I wind up no, now? I think everything uh, of, uh, of our debate is have been met. Uh, yeah. All the points that we want to discuss. Yes, um, yes. I'm with you, sir. Oh, he is, uh, he is in audio. Brian, are you there? No, yes. he's, yes. He's, he's, yes. He's, yes, he's yes. entering. Am I audible, sir? 
yeah, well, yeah in, but, hey, but your 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 motion picture is not your video is yes yes all right okay yeah uh, okay mr marota i can get that in uh, i was saying yes. just as a parting shot you introduced yes. uh, uh, in trying to answer your question sir oh you got the you got the other uh, question right okay yes, just proceed if you got the question okay um i think it's going to be very 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 difficult for us to have or for <laughs> future to say that uh, the, inter the, interna the International Criminal Court is going to have jurisdiction over, over both nuclear, chemical, and, and, and biological weapons, looking at uh, the political landscapes. Because if you can go back to 1998, uh, it was a clash between poor and rich countries. Uh, poor countries uh, arguing that because they cannot afford nuclear weapons now, uh, the rich countries would, would, would want to argue that they should not be allowed to use whatever they can afford. And if, and the absence of, uh, new, the absence of uh, nuclear weapons, new, new prohibition of nuclear weapons in the, in the Rome statute is always going to be very, very difficult because it looks like it's a clash between uh, the poor and, and poor and rich countries. All right, uh, I, I, that is good. But there's another question I put across, probably when you're offline. I just wanted to be sure that you got it. Uh, I'm sure that was well answered, and Dr. Sripathi also gave in a very good uh, input. Now, uh, I'd also there was some put some input by Dr. Marotta, I think, as well. Now, mine was specifically also to you on the issue of the canons of interpretation. Uh, in the light of the arguments we put across uh, literal interpretation, we have about three major interpretation canons of, of you know, uh, instruments of, available to the, whoever wants to interpret texts. There's the literal interpretation, and uh, there is the issue of looking at the intention of the drafters by going back to the... You brought in very well your argument on Vienna Convention um, Article 32, and I try to refer you also to look at uh, the emphasis that was laid in Article 31, Paragraph 4. And I underscored the fact that there was a challenge. Even at the time they were doing 31-4, they, they were aware that it would not be easy to be problematic uh, when we keep on relying on the intention. I just wanted to ask you whether you still have other information about what you want to share with us and the viewers on the issue of other options of interpretation that will be available to the court in respect of this very vexing provision. Looking at the way you very ably uh, uh, put across, you very, very well put across uh, the arguments of 32 of Vienna Convention Law Treaties. Or anything general about okay. interpretation, your, your views on this one as a party. Yes. Hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, the problem that the courts normally have is moving away uh, because what they will normally use is the literal interpretation. If they are satisfied, then they will, they will, close, they will close the case. The problem is at what point do the court move away from the literal interpretation to look into the uh, mission of the statute? So uh, perhaps uh, Prof can shed, shed light on that. And at what point do the court take that detour okay. to say that now we're moving away from uh, the literal interpretation? Okay, that's a good question. Ordinarily, when we talk of the literal interpretation, it's clear that the plain meaning of, of the statement would be able to communicate what uh, actually the intention itself is. Uh, the plain meaning would bring out any ambiguity would not be arise. It's very, it's an ambiguous, and the parties have no contest unless one is trying to advance a nefarious argument or inter construction of that particular provision. Then it would have all these other instruments available to it. Uh, but essentially, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule uh, that uh, governs how the court would interpret, would approach a particular interpretation. It depends on who is presiding and what school of thought they hold. Because, you know, 
we hold different schools of thought. I subscribe, I ascribe to a different school of thought. Uh, Professor Sripathi, Doctor, each of us would subscribe, uh, ascribe to any school of thought. Would even try to engineer our own school of thought in virtue by virtue of you know our standings. Uh, as intellectuals, we need to have our own positions most of the time. I take my own uh, you know analysis and I always give my own parameter about a situation. So how the course would approach one would depend on that particular presiding officer. Uh, even if it were the, the, let's talk about the International Criminal Court and the trial chamber or pre-trial chamber where this issue, would, in my view, would first be litigated very hotly. Each of them, probably of, if it's presided over by the three judges at that point, each of them would have their own view uh, on a particular place. They could concur and dissent on a particular point. So uh, the issue of interpretation would be if, to me, there's no contest at any level and the court itself is satisfied with their own position, that that interpretation would lead them to drawing a logical conclusion at the end about the outcome of the case. Then they will take that particular uh, line of interpretation. But as I say, each case would be determined on a fact to fact, uh, on a case to case basis. All right. Uh, I think it would go on and on, but if you have one last thing to say, then we hear it just on interpretation. I just want you to talk about interpretation because of the way you approach it would in a good manner, right? Anything, if not, then I'll be able to wind up unless it prefers something else. Yes, Mr. Ampane. Can you hear me? No, you can, you can, you can wind up, sir. You have nothing more. Yes, I can hear you. You can wind up, sir. No, I can <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Prof. If there's nothing oh, else, oh, I, I want to yeah. thank you all. Uh, <laughs> we are not putting you in a corner. <laughs> You've done very well. No, uh, Prof. There's uh, always. A I would question. like to. I yes. Like to save, save it for another day. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I like that. Thank you, uh, our viewers, wherever you are. It has been awesome. Uh, we, we thank you for being with us this end. And we thank you, panelists, for all uh, that you uh, contributed towards this very vexing topic. And uh, we hope to see you next time. That is all for now. And bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 bye.